so it occurred to me as I was just sitting here to talk about anger today. Um, this applies to other emotions as well, but I feel like we're in a, you know, we're seeing the consequences of certain types of societal, individual anger um, sort of are very present in our media these days. And I've said what I'm going to say today many times, but I'm going to go into more detail, I think. Right, we'll see what happens. Um, because I, although it seems clear to me these days, I realize that maybe I have not communicated it clearly enough. One of the fundamental skills to learn as a human being is that we can honor, accept, care for, and validate our anger without believing that what our anger says is true. This is going to apply to other emotions, but today we'll talk about anger. I'll say that again. One of the most fundamental things to learn as a human being, and maybe uh, this applies to all the emotions, is to learn that our emotions can be honored. They don't need to be repressed or shut down or fixed. They can be honored and accepted and uh, validated without believing that what our emotions say about the world is true. This is very challenging because the essence of having an emotion is that the way the world seems to that emotion seems true, right? That's the whole point. So let's just do an example. The example you've heard in my class many times is the young child who thinks there's a scary monster under the bed. So they come into the parents' room and they are terrified of the monster under the bed. And so what can we do? Well, we could be annoyed. There's no freaking monster under your bed, little kid, right? <laughs> There's nothing to be scared of. Go back to bed. I'm trying to sleep. I think most parents are not going to do that. But that's, that's honestly how we res respond to a lot of people's emotions in our life and including our own. They're like, oh, it's just stupid. I, I'm terrified, but there's nothing for me to be scared of. Just stop being scared. Right? Or I'm angry, but it's not good for me to be angry. It's, it's bad for me to be angry. It's a bad thing to be an angry person. So I'm not going to be angry. Right? So the dismissing the child right away is honestly what we do, what a lot of us do to our own emotional life a lot of the time. And we do it at an unconscious level sometimes, so unconscious that we're just at a deep level of repression for the emotions that are there. It's almost like we don't even hear the kid. We, we're like, we see the kid and we put in a sleeping pill so we don't have to hear them screaming, <laughs> right? That's how, that's how aggressively we ignore some of our emotional life. Right? So we don't want to do that, right? The, the kid needs to be heard. The kid is scared and needs to be comforted. So we can do that a number of ways too. We could try to explain very calmly that there is no monster under the bed. And that's, there's, something, uh, there's something useful about that kind of approach, but it's not, the, it's not the approach we need to start with. Because, and you all know this from your own experience, if you're having an emotion and then someone just tells you why you shouldn't be having the emotion, even if they're very loving, and really have your best interest at heart, right? If they're just explaining to you, well, no, you shouldn't, you, you, that's not the way the world is. You're not, and you don't have to, it's, it's not, those people are not doing that to you or whatever it is. You don't feel hurt, right? And so the emotion gets, I mean, very rarely does that make you feel hurt, right? Usually you feel like a resistance, like you haven't heard what I'm saying and the emotion doesn't get res resolved. Again, I'm not saying never 
someone can give a very compelling speech to say that you're safe right now, right? And you can really buy it. The first thing that happened, the first thing that it has to happen for an emotion to be healed is it has to be fully heard and felt. What we can do for another is listen to the emotion and acknowledge that they're having the emotion. What we can do for ourselves is the same thing. I'm scared. I'm angry. And from this anger or this fear, it seems like the world is dangerous. If you don't do that, then the, the nervous system doesn't believe that you're going, you, you can't make it feel safe because it doesn't think you're taking the threat seriously. So until I know you've heard what I'm worried about, I can't know that you're gonna help me fix the thing that I'm worried about or that you're gonna be able to show me that the worried thing isn't real because you haven't heard exactly what I'm worried about. So you have to hear exactly what they're worried about, scared about, angry about. You have to hear what you're worried about, scared about, angry about, how it feels to be scared, angry, worried. So the kid comes into the room and we're like, wait, wait, what are you scared of? There's a monster on your, there's a monster on your bed? Why, why, what, what, how, what kind of monster? What, what, are you, what are you imagining? How does that make you feel? Yeah, I just wanna sleep in your room, is that okay? Well, sure, if there's a monster on your bed, what, 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 why do you think that, right? You let them talk and explain, let them be heard, let them know that, yes, you, if, if need be, you can stay here. I mean, we've got to set boundaries at a certain point, right? There's possibilities where you're really authentically listening to what's being expressed. Now, this whole time that you're listening to the child, do you ever believe there's a monster under the child's bed? Probably not. Even if you listen, like you're really like, okay, tell me. You're like, I, I know it's not a monster. Maybe they did hear a mouse, right? Maybe they did. Or maybe there is a weird shape under there. There's like hockey sticks you stepped under there earlier in the day. Maybe there's something, right, that the, the fear is based on. But you don't believe there's a monster under the bed. And that doesn't change the fact that you can fully and compassionately be there for the child. Again, we can do this for ourselves. Ultimately, that being heard will, will make that child feel safe, that will allow the child to listen to you in return. Maybe you can just tell the child and it will understand that there's not a monster, or you can go show the child that there's not a monster. If the child, you know, and we, some fears are very, are traumatic and, and are repetitive and are very resistant to reason and then you have to do a lot more safety you may have to let them sleep with you and you know you got to do a lot more creation of safety but for ourselves and that's true for ourselves again some of our fears are easily dismissed once we get a clear head and can look and some of our fears are tied into deep traumas that have been with us for a long time So the fundamental thing I'm talking about today, though, is this ability to be fully compassionate and understanding without believing, fully and compassionate and understanding of an emotion and uh, validating of emotion. So the validating part I didn't really talk about. It's important to be able to say to that kid, I understand that if you think there's a monster under your bed, that is scary, right? That validates that. It makes sense that if there were a monster under my bed, I would probably be scared. That makes a lot of sense. It even makes sense to me that if you heard a noise under your bed, you might think it was something dangerous. That makes sense too. You validate as much as you can of the rationale behind the emotion or the, the sense of, of truth behind the emotion, if that makes sense. When you have an emotion, there is a sense that it's based on some true facts in the world. And that is always 
real. We don't have emotions for no reason unless we genuinely have some chemical imbalance, right? When, for, for when we're not having some chemical imbalance, we genuinely have whatever emotion it is for a reason. It doesn't mean it's a good reason for everybody, but it's a reason. And when you look at that reason from the perspective of the emotion, it does seem like a good reason. So the kid is scared. There's no monster under the bed. So from an objective standpoint, there's no reason to be scared. But that's not gonna validate it. That's not gonna make the kid feel validated. So we go in and we say, what's the perspective from the emotion? Well, yeah, a monster under the bed is scary. <laughs> what kind of what kind of monster is it? Is it got teeth? Is it got claws? What is it? Is it evil? You know, the, once you describe this monster, you would go, yes, that makes sense that that would be experienced as scary. So we can be compassionate, we can be understanding, we can listen, and we can even validate an emotion. without the whole time never believing that what the emotion is saying is true. By the way, not to say that an emotion is never saying something true. I actually believe that an emotion is always slightly diluted, but we don't need to go into that today. For, for most of our everyday life, it's useful to um, except that, yeah, sometimes our, our emotions are saying something actually true about the world, right? Yeah, that lion is dangerous to me that I've just encountered in the jungle, genuinely. So some emotions do say true things, but you don't have to believe them to validate them or understand them. And the validating and understanding is necessary to heal the emotion or to um, integrate the emotion. So I have a question here that what if the monster is nebulous and has no details and is just sort of a, a scary feeling and that of course happens. Um, and so you just start with where people are, you know, it, it, when we practice mindfulness, what we're doing is we look where we are and sometimes the thing we find is very vague. And that's just where we start then. I just have a vague feeling of unease. And you, 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 you start there and you're like, okay, I hear that. You have a vague feeling of unease. It's like, and you can then start to explore it. You can do that with other people as well. You can ask if they have any other, do any pictures come to mind or do any stories arise or what does it make you want to do behaviorally, right? Um, usually you're not acknowledging something like that unless it's having some effect in your life. And then you can get really specific about what that effect is right? so we try to meet ourselves right now we're, we're i'm sort of jumping back and forth between meeting another person and we're starting with a child for a reason for meeting a child where they are and we can do the same thing we can meet ourselves where they are wherever they are it doesn't have to make sense what they're saying it doesn't have to like logically right to be able to be compassionate to even validate it Sometimes you do have to little work, do a little work to validate it. Again, if they have a very vague sense of, of feeling, you just, you're just going to say something like, oh, yeah, a vague sense of unease is uncomfortable. I get that. That's validating, right? That, that's all they can give you. Then you validate that, right? With a kid, we can help a little bit more, too. We can be like, oh, you sound confused. Are you confused? You know, you can be a little bit more directive to try and help them You get, have language they might not have to um, pull out their, uh, to get more specific about their emotion. And you can do that for yourself as well. Very often, we don't want to look at the emotion. So we have to, and so it arises in a vague way, and we then turn away. So we have to elicit more specifics from it. And it can include sort of go, doing guessing things like, am I confused, right? You can ask that and see what response comes up when we work with ourselves. So we, can validate, understand, be compassionate toward, towards, be a good listener towards, 
without believing what the emotion says. So what, is, what do emotions say? What's the key part that we might want to disengage from believing? So, so emotions sometimes say very factual things like there's a monster under the bed, right? That's something we can believe or disbelieve. But they also say things like there's a bad thing under the bed, right? The monster is bad. So there's always a emotional or judgmental, uh, sorry, a value or judgmental element to the emotion. And you don't have to believe that judgmental element of the emotion to be compassionate towards the emotion. Again, you can validate it. Yes, that would seem bad. I get that. Right? It would seem bad to have a monster under your bed, but you don't have to believe it. And this is where it gets more complicated, more subtle with as adults, because our Sometimes, many times, and we're seeing this, unfortunately, very much in our political discourse these days, sometimes our emotions do make us see monsters where there are not monsters, right? Literally, it's just as bad as it gets. Like, we're seeing total illusions because of our emotions. Um, I, I mean, I shouldn't even say sometimes. It happens quite a bit. It happens in our relationships. It happens in our politics. We're literally seeing factual things that are not there. But also many, many times what the emotion is telling us is about what's bad or good. And there isn't really a disagreement about the factual elements, but there's a disagreement about how bad or good something is. So I come into my, the kitchen and my partner hasn't, ha has just finished washing the dishes and they're all in the drying rack. And I pick up a spoon and it's still got spots on it. Okay, and now, there's not a disagreement. Like if we both look at the spoon, we'll go, there's spots on it, right? So there's not actually a disagreement about facts, but I am angry and annoyed because, well, that's bad. First of all, it's just bad. Like it's a bad, there's an immediate judgment of that being bad. Now we could go into the details of why that's bad. It's bad because you're disrespecting me or you're not taking your time or you don't, or you know how much I care about or whatever. There could be a list of things that are bad, right? But it starts with this value judgment. And so we have to make sure when we validate or listen to an emotion that we key in on the value experience that's being had, on the judgment experience that's being had, because that's where the core of the emotion resides. Often we'll spin out when we're in emotion and we'll say all sorts of things. We'll be trying to describe all sorts of facts and da-da-da-da, but the ones that matter are the ones that are like, the thing that matters is where is our judgment? Where is our value judgment? And that's how we can hone in on the emotion. And that's how we can validate it most quickly as well, by the way. So we could just use the dishwashing example to sort of use that as an example here. If, if you, if I can, we'll just keep using me. Uh, I'm, I'm usually actually the person who doesn't wash the dishes properly. So <laughs> it's a reversal of reality, but um, so, uh, you know, that conversation, let's just imagine a, a relationship that's not going that well. That conversation could get into all sorts of things, right? You come into the kitchen and you see the spoon and then you're angry. Then it annoys you and you get angry. 
And then maybe you say, um, I say, uh, oh, come on, you didn't wash the spoons well. And then they get defensive. Like, God, you're such a, uh, you're such a, what is it called when you're, you're so anal, let's say, or you're, uh, you're, you're such a nitpicker, right? Or you're always nagging, right? And then that makes me annoyed because I'm not nagging and this is important, right? Okay, and now, so now there's emotion going on and now there's so many things that one is angry about here, right? And it's probably things in the relationship and we can go back to like the 20 different things can might pop into your head. And there's the way the tone of voice when you said I was nagging and right, there's, there's in the, in the expression on your face, there's all sorts of things that are the object of the anger here. So, you know, I wouldn't use the word value judgment in an actual conversation. I'll say, wait, what are you actually angry about, right? And that's the way we might hone in on. And at first, it's going to be a long list, right? But what actually seems bad? Or, you know, usually with something like this, what actually hurts? So let's be specific with anger because that's what I wanted to talk about today. Anger, most of these emotions are, but anger is one of the, has this feature maybe the most, the most strongly of all our emotions. It's very other directed, it's very blame directed. So it, um, it focuses outward, right? And it says the other has done something wrong. That's the value judgment in anger. That's the core thing that makes it anger as opposed to something else. And usually they've done something wrong. They've wronged me in some way. Now the me can get narrow or wide. Like they could wrong my family or they could wrong my political party. They could wrong my country or they could wrong my nature, but it's still me in some sense, some broad sense. They have done something wrong and it's wrong something I value. But why do we get angry? That's not why we get angry. We get angry because they've done something that hurts <laughs> or they've done something that scares us that we're going, it's going to hurt. So when we listen to our anger, we first need to listen to the other directed point of view of the anger. You, and this is very, can be very hard in a relationship and it's very hard in life at large because uh, when anger is directed at us, it's like an attack and our very, our, uh, our natural response is defense, which is the opposite of listening. But we can do this for ourselves better than others. So let's talk about working with ourselves. We get angry. We want to first listen to the other directed story that the anger is telling. So just like we asked the kid, what's out under the bed? So let's go back to the kid. What's going on? Uh, there's, a, there's a boogeyman under the bed, right? They don't say, even say they're scared, right? They probably say, right, out, there's a monster under the bed. Oh my God, what kind of monster? It's got fangs and it's, da -da -da -da, and it's growling at me and it's going to get me. All other directed, right? It's about something out in the world. Now, if we're paying attention, we can see that they are scared. They're having an internal experience as well. And so if we wanted to speed things up here, it'd be like, okay, how does that monster make you feel, right? So now we move, the second step would be moved towards the inside of the emotion. So with anger, it's what's the other directed statements? How does the anger see the world? I'm angry because I see that person is doing that thing wrong. Now, how do we validate that? So how do we validate the, uh, the other directed, the external statement first? That person is not washing the spoon properly. It sounds ridiculous, but a lot of our anger sounds ridiculous when you really stay so you have to keep going. Well, is that bad? Is not washing a spoon bad? Well, yes, it's bad. Now, some people will just stop there, but probably not. Probably you go, it's bad because, right? 
And now we're still listening. We're listening more. We're listening to the other directive, the externalization of the anger and saying it's bad because we could go through a whole bunch of things. Like one could be literally because germs, right? Possible. It's usually going to be something more personal than that, though. It's bad because they're not respecting or I've asked so many times or I like things to be done right. You see, as you start to move further down, I starts to become it and starts to get a little more personal. You notice, I think that's important to notice there. When we we're first, our, our anger is so externalized and it's so objectified in its language that we don't realize it's, we're, we're, we're pretending it has nothing to do with us. I'm angry because that person is doing something wrong, objectively, independently. Anybody in the universe would see them doing that wrong thing and would say the exact same thing. So the first external statement of anger, and often, and unfortunately, many of us just live in this area. There's an objective bad thing in the world. Uh, if we live in that area, then we believe that statement, right? So in order to validate that anger without necessarily believing it, we first say, okay, what, how do things seem to you? Well, that seems wrong what that person's doing. But then as you keep going, well, because why? Because this, that, and the other thing, as you saw, as I said, well, because they don't respect me. Oh, hey, it's coming back to you now. Personal. It's no longer as objective. Or because I really like a clean house and they know that, oh, hey, it's back to you. We're starting to get a little bit more personal. So every emotion is personal at some level. If you are stating your emotions without any personalization, you're avoiding your feelings. And you're not validating them, honestly, because the emotion is all of this. It's the external part, but it's also, it's the monster under the bed, but it's also the feeling of terror in the bottom. So I can acknowledge you're super angry about these spoons. I get it. It feels like I disrespected you. I get it. It feels like it's something that really made you feel safe as a kid to have a really clean kitchen, right? Whatever. We can go through it. We can really get into it and, and validate it totally. And never believe any time that, that a spot on a spoon matters. actually matters right independently of all this other stuff it does matter in this personal sense this would be so challenging in, in relationships with other people because they may be saying something you really think is false about you you first have to acknowledge their anger to ever be able to have a conversation about what's really going on with you and them just like with the monster in the bed. You first have to acknowledge the fear before you can ever have a conversation about what's actually under the bed. And if you go on social media, there's just a bunch of people being angry. I mean, that's not the only thing, but there's a lot of people just being angry at each other. And they're both in their own anger, right? So they're both staying, uh, they're both in the externalization, right? They're sort of like, this is the way the world is, and this is the world the way the world is, and that's it. End of story. There's no going back saying, it really scares me when this world is this way. <laughs> if both people go, I'm really scared when the world is this way, that's not a conflict anymore. That's not a contradiction. That's two people with different emotions. Likewise with ourselves. So it is incredibly important to validate our anger, all our emotions, but definitely our anger. One reason I'm picking anger to talk about today, other than what's going on in the world, is that anger is usually a, the sur most surfacey of the emotions. So it's the one that's keeping you the most protected from your internal vulnerability. And in order to get down to that vul your vulnerability, you need to um, fully feel the anger first. Right? You need to fully acknowledge and accept this anger that's there 
or else that, otherwise it just sits there as a shield over your vulnerable parts of your emotional self. There's a lot of energy trapped in our anger. So we it's very important to validate it. It can be scary because uh, many times anger has not been safe in our life, the anger of others or the, our own anger. So because, because when we believe our anger, we can do some pretty awful things. And some other people have done some awful things to us when they believe their anger. They believe the truth of it. Well, you didn't do the spoon, so you deserve to be hurt is really what is happening, right? You deserve to be punished is what happens in the externalization of the anger. Anger is the fight part of fight or flight. So it wants to attack the thing that is going to hurt us. So a lot of harm can be done with our anger. So it's understandable that we as a society feel like we want to rep repress it, and we as individuals might be scared of it. Mm. There are gender differences here in our culture, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get into them too much, but it is, there are reasons that both women and men, and they're usually a little different, have reasons not to express their anger. And so it can be useful to sort of acknowledge that for yourself, that maybe you've never really felt allowed to be angry. But it's really key to make this very subtle difference as you go into working with these kinds of emotions. I can validate this without having to, this may be the best way to start. I can validate this without having to decide right now whether it's right. I can validate this without having to decide right now whether it's what it's saying about the world is true. I can, can be compassionate and listen to it and even express it in certain healthy ways without having to decide whether it's right. So I'm angry at my dad, say. And for something, some pattern of behavior over, over, over the, our, the years of our relationship. And I don't want to get into it. So I never express that anger. But the anger says, my father was not a good father because he did this, that, and the other thing. How can I go feel that, that feeling and validate it in a healthy way? Well, one thing that happens is we're like, oh, it's just time for me to feel this anger. And we go and express it to our father. <laughs> and we're just like, you did all this. Da, 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 da. And honestly, that can be better than what we were doing before, because at least it's starting to move now. But it can cause a lot of harm. And it can trigger responses that end up putting you right back in the where you're like, oh God, I can never feel that anger again, right? I need to put that back down underneath. And it never actually gets validated because your father got attacked, so immediately defended himself and never going to validate that feeling of anger. So now the anger got expressed, but never got validated and it never got to resolve the issue. So how do we feel that anger? Well, we go into it and we say, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. I feel like my father neglected me for his own selfish reasons. It doesn't even matter. It's true because because we can know that humans are complex and our father had probably lots of things going on and we could tell all that story. But that's not the important story about anger. If you start telling that story right at the beginning, the anger will not be heard, will feel like you're rejecting it. Just as if you tell the kid, no, there can't be a, a monster on your bed because monsters don't exist and da, 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 da. It's true what you're saying. 
but it's not the plate. That's not the time. You don't validate the emotion that way. So likewise, you don't go, well, I shouldn't be angry at my dad. He, he had a lot going on and, you know, he, he, he was trying his best and da, 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 da. That's all that can be. That's all true. And that's probably where we want to end up is being compassionate and understanding towards those who, who seem to have wronged us. But to validate the emotion, we, we can't go there right away. What we want to do is hold a place for that to happen later. So what we say is, I don't need to decide whether this is true. And we say things like, it feels as if. It f- I feel like I've been hurt. I feel like I have was neglected. I feel like they never listened. Whatever it is, right? I'm going through that thing. And we su- use the word I feel or something like it so that from the beginning, we're not just in the externalization, right? We're already looking at the internal aspect, the subjective element of it. And the subjective element is not, not false. As long as you accurately feel it, then you, you can't be wrong about how it felt. It felt like my father never listened to me and never cared what happened to me. You can't be wrong about that. It's probably not true. They probably really did care about you. Maybe they didn't, but it's probable they did care, but it felt like they didn't. You're not wrong. You're not wrong that it felt like they didn't care. And you're not wrong that their behavior led to you feeling that way. And it pisses you off and you're not wrong about that. And you want to, and then you fill in the blank, you want to punish them in some way. You're not wrong about that. You want that as well. So interpersonally, you would go, all those things, I hear you want that, and you think I should be punished, and I, I get it a lot. And then you say something like, I understand why that behavior made you feel that way. I can see why hearing a mouse under the bed or a noise under the bed might, would make, make you get scared. I can see that. I can see why the fact that I, when I came home, I immediately started drinking and watching TV made you feel like I didn't care what had happened to you, right? I can totally get that. That would be an interpersonal way. But we don't always get the chance to heal this stuff interpersonally. So we have to do it for ourselves. And so we say the same thing. I can see, of course, it makes sense that when you, if, if, when you'd come home, your father wouldn't look at you because they were, were drinking, that you would feel neglected. It would piss you off. Now let's just finish up here and let's see if we can sort of bring this into the political realm a little bit. Because if politics is making you angry, it's personal. It makes you say, of course, politics is personal. There's a reason for that. Again, it doesn't mean you're not right. But if you want to heal your emotional life, if, you're, if political world or things that are happening in global events, or, you have to put aside whether you're right or wrong. You have to say, I'm not going to decide that for right now. What does it feel like? It feels like my society is becoming less safe. I feel scared that there are people that are walking down the street that, that want to do me harm or, you know, I, I can go down the list. Or I, it feels like there are governments that want to control my body or want to control my possessions. Or it feels like um, I live in a society that no longer cares anymore about the vulnerable 
whatever it is in my hand. So we put aside whether um, cutting welfare 10% is good or bad for the poor. We just put that off to the side, right? Because again, there is a way of, there are, I'm a very progressive person, just put it out there, but it's not relevant. Like there are legitimate positions one could be like, you know, we, sh we should cut welfare. Like you could say that and actually care about the poor. You could say that and have a, a philosophy which thought it would be better for people if you did cut welfare. So when we wanna heal our emotional stuff, we put the arguments off to the side. And we say, what does it feel like? When we find ourselves in an argument with somebody else and politically, again, you're going to go nowhere if you stay in the realm of who's right and wrong. If anger is involved, if there's no anger involved, if you guys just love each other and you have different differences in politics, you can have a long philosophical discussion about it. And that's great. But that's not where we most of us find ourselves, right? So if there's anger involved or fear, they usually are both, decide arguing about who's right or wrong is not going to get you very far. Until you, until you get to the point where you, you agree you're both on the same side of trying to understand each other. So you have to validate, right? I find it very challenging because we really have created epistemic bubbles in our society now where whole chunks of people just believe really different facts. So it can feel like you have to you have to believe in an illusion to validate someone's feelings, but you don't have to do that. Right? You can be like, "Yeah, I can understand if you think Obama is going to impose a police state or whatever thought of that there, then then that would be scary. That makes a lot of sense." Because the truth is uh, the other side of the political view, their emotions make sense if you stop to hear why they think they're there. They don't make sense if you're thinking about it from your perspective that there's not an actual monster under the bed. But they do make sense when you ask what they actually are experiencing, what their actual feelings are. We sort of need to separate those two things out, right? What's going on under the bed is separate from how the person on the bed feels. If everyone's anger and fear went away, we'd actually be able to resolve the questions about what's under the bed or not pretty quickly. There's some things that are very complex, like society is complex and it's not Sometimes bigger government's a good idea and sometimes smaller government's a good idea. I think that's probably true, right? There's gonna be different, certain things that solve certain things, right? But that's not what our political problem is. Our political problem is emotional. And then the emotional stuff has led to deeply different views of the actual factual world. but the internal is externalized and the external is internalized. What's happening in the political world is happening inside of you. And the process for healing is very similar in both directions. This skill, we learn by practicing with ourselves and then we start to apply it better with other people. This skill to put off to the side what is right or wrong in order to acknowledge, listen to, validate the emotions that we're feeling. 
We start here with anger because it's so prevalent in our society, but again, because it's the most surface one. And when you start to heal the anger, you get to move down a level into the next emotion. And you probably are gonna move fairly quickly into some kind of fear, and then you can heal the fear. And usually you're gonna move down, you get to some kind of grief. You keep healing these emotions as they un peel like an onion, you get to love is the emotion that's underneath it all. We're angry because we love something. We're scared because we love something. We're sad because we love something. And the healing and integration of our emotions is when we connect them deep down into the love that is the source of them. Okay, let's sit for 15 minutes here. <clears throat> Please, if you're on Facebook, feel free to send me a message or um, a question and, and, and I can answer it during the week. I can't see any comments uh, during class. I do wanna remind everybody that I'm still, te I'm, we're I'm teaching a six week course called the six uh, life-changing, earth-shaking, mind-bending half-truths that everyone should know. And it's, um, we've had, we had the first week last week, but it's a recorded class. So you can still sign up for a whole six week class. I will send you the first week recording. Um, it's on Sundays at four to 5.30 PM Pacific time, but you do not have to be there live because I send out the recording the day after. So if that doesn't fit with your schedule, but you're still interested in taking the class, please uh, sign up and I'll send you the recordings and you can still interact with me, send me questions during the week if, if you have any, if you're watching. You can also just sign up for one class, see if you're interested. Um, uh, last week we did the truth of life creation, and this week we are doing the truth of empty aliveness. Uh, the truth of life creation is a fundamental truth everyone needs to know about how we create our lives. And um, if we don't know that, we sort of go about building our life um, in, a, in a way in which we're expending a whole bunch of energy in areas that are not useful. Um, the truth of empty aliveness is a truth about what fundamentally is, so it's very, very deep, philosophical, even physical truth. And it um, is it a perspective one can directly experience on the meditation path. And we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. It involves, the discussion tomorrow will involve the truth of suffering. So we'll talk about how suffering works, the truth of impermanence. Um, it involves the truth of sensory completeness, a story about how the sensory world works. Uh, it intrudes the story of emptiness and the story of empty aliveness. So it's, there's a lot of uh, in fundamental elements of the meditation path there, but also, again, very the whole class is designed to point to some of the most practical experiences one can have as a result of the meditation path um, and how they can radically change your perspective of your life and reduce suffering. So all are welcome. All right, let's sit. So we really want to work on healing our emotions from two sides. One is really addressing and feeling and listening to the painful emotions as they arise. 
and validating them without letting their belief systems take over our life. But the other is working from the other side, working from where it all comes from. And that's the love that drives us forward in our lives. And when we sit in meditation, uh, the first thing we're doing is using our attention to look at something. In this case, let's choose our breath. And so you can feel your breath in your belly. But the attention is a loving attention. Hmm. This is why we recommend focusing on some part of your experience that already feels somewhat positive. If, if your breath does not feel positive, look somewhere else. But even a slight bit of positivity allows you to look at that more easily with a loving attitude of, oh yeah, I'm attending to this good feeling in my experience. Or just this feeling that's not a problem. That's nice too. The attention we give in meditation is not an attention. It's the exact attention we were just describing. We give our child when they come to us scared. It's not an attention that's designed to fix what they're looking at. It's actually not an attention that's designed to interpret or figure out what's true intellectually in what we're experiencing. It's not an attention that's really about memory. It's not about remembering and, and getting some experience that you can tell other people about. It's an experience of genuinely listening to because you care about what's going on. So can you genuinely listen to the breath in your stomach, in your belly? Because you care, because it feels good, because you're interested. So loving attention that's there just to listen. The truth is that if you look closely enough anywhere in your universe, all the secrets of the universe can be revealed. So there's a reason to look with love at the object of meditation because it has a secret to reveal to you. It contains a secret of great value, a treasure. This is, I am not really speaking that metaphorically. It's actually true. When we really keep focusing in on an object of meditation, we are opening a box, which within is a is the source of the universe, the magical source of everything. And even if you don't believe a word I'm saying, try to look as if you did believe to see what would happen if you listen to your breath as if it was about to tell you the most delightful, fundamentally important, life-changing secret. And we're just going to work actually with a, a little mantra today. I'm just going to use the mantra as we keep focusing on the breath. Use the mantra, I love you. If you want to sort of direct that sentence towards what you're focused on, you can do that. You can also let the I love you start to fleet, float a little more freely and apply to a broader amount of things. 
I love you. 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 And so the phrase is just there on its own to repeat, to be repeated. It's replacing other thoughts. If you are feeling any actual lovingness, any juice behind that statement, you can bring that into your attention as well. Really feeling what it feels like to start to waken up your heart or the love in your gut or your mind. I love you, I love you, I love you. The truth is our natural state is I love you. That is our natural state. What I mean by that is we add things on top of that that get between us and the I, I love you state. So for instance, if our belly doesn't feel good, then that not feeling good blocks us from experiencing the natural state of just loving the feeling. If we're angry, scared, sad, all those things, and that's okay. So what we do then is we direct the I love you to the thing that's in between us and the love. So I'm not feeling any love for the belly, because why? Well, notice what's in between. What is shielding you from love? And you might find a numb part in your body or a numb part in the belly or a hard part or a cold part. And we start to direct our love towards that part. And how do we direct our love towards those parts that are shielded or cold or numb? Well, we're compassionate. They are shielded or cold or numb because things happened. Shit happened. And they smartly, at the time, decided to protect you out of love. So you can be grateful to those parts that are numb right now. You can be grateful to those parts that are cold or tight because they're anxious. And you can just let them be there as they are. I love you. 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 Love works like the sun, uh, the spring sun uh, shining down on the two feet of snow that got packed up over the winter. The sun has no intention to get rid of the snow. It doesn't, have, it, it, it's just, in fact, it's shining on the snow, making the snow look so beautiful. The sun has no problem with the snow. The sun just equally falls on the snow and everything else, but the sun also melts the snow. Patiently, without any hurry. And that's how love works. When we direct love towards those parts of us, that love is not intending to fix them. It's not intending to, to make those parts change. It, it sees those parts as beautiful those parts that are challenging. The love lights up the beauty of those parts of us. And yes, over time, it starts to melt those parts until they can, 
sort of melt back into the love itself until they can allow for the sun to hit the earth of our self. I love you, I love you, I love you. We'll just continue with that practice. Okay, so that's the guided sit for today. You're welcome to continue sitting for a longer period of time, of course. If you're finished, it's nice to thank your body for sitting still. Give it a little love. Let it move sort of how it wants to move. Maybe do some intentional stretching or movement. I like to stretch out my neck. That really feels good to me. You can stand up and move around. 
important that stillness is a fundamental part of the form of the formal practice of meditation, but it's not because physical stillness is better than physical movement. And so you want to sort of balance that out and remind your body that you like movement just as much as you like stillness. Thanks for the stillness. Here's some movement. Okay, Facebook, thanks for stopping by. If you ever want to come on and um, ask some questions, uh, on, come on by the Zoom class. You can sign up in my, um, in my bio. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you next week.